So HIV, it's one of the biggest, most uh, profound health challenges we've faced. But where did it actually come from? It's a question that, you know, has had a lot of mystery around it, speculation, sometimes fear, but also thankfully years of really incredible scientific detective work. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into that exact scientific journey. We want to trace HIV's origins, really understand that initial leap from animals to humans, how it then spread across continents, and, crucially, debunk some myths that still hang around. We've dug into some detailed briefings, studies, lots of research to bring you the key insights. Yeah, and it really is a fascinating story of scientific discovery. It, um, it highlights how this kind of evidence-based research helps us peel back the layers. Mm -hmm. We get to understand not just what happened, but the how and the why behind such a huge public health issue. It's all about following the data. Okay, let's unpack that starting point then. HIV didn't just materialize, right? Scientists call it a zoonosis. What's that actually mean when we talk about where HIV began? Right. So a zoonosis is basically an infection that started in animals and then somehow made the jump across the species barrier into humans. For HIV, all the scientific evidence points towards something called simian immunodeficiency virus, SIV, specifically uh, a strain called SIVCPZ. SIVCPZ, and that's found in chimpanzees yeah. in Central Africa. And what's really interesting is that this SIVCPZ actually causes an illness in chimps that's, well, it's very much like AIDS in humans. So you can see the direct link there. Wow. Okay. So a virus in chimps. How does something like that make the jump? How does it cross over into people? What's the thinking there? Well, the most accepted theory, the one with the most evidence, points to something pretty direct. Hunting. Specifically, hunting and butchering chimpanzees for what's often called bushmeat. Oh, okay. Imagine a hunter you know, maybe getting injured during that process, a cut or a wound. <laughs> that allows infected chimpanzee blood to get into their own bloodstream. Direct exposure. That makes sense. And this whole situation was probably... Um, made worse, or at least more likely, by the European colonization of that part of Africa, equatorial Africa, back in the late 19th century. How so? Well, colonization led to much more human movement into previously sort of untouched rainforest areas. People were going in for resources, like rubber was a big one. This just increased the chances for humans and infected animals to come into contact. More interaction, more risk. Okay. And we often hear about HIV-1 and HIV-2, are they related to this origin story? What's the difference? Good question. Yes, they are. So HIV-1 is the type that's spread all over the world. It's the main one by far. And it's actually divided into four different genetic groups, M, N, O, and P. Four groups. Yeah. And each of those groups, M, N, O, and P, represents a separate time the virus jumped from a primate to a human. So it happened at least four independent times. Group M is the one that really took off. It accounts for you know, almost all HIV-1 infections globally. Now, HIV-2 is a bit different. It came from sooty mangabe monkeys, not chimps, over in West Africa, probably around 1940. It generally causes uh, severe immune problems less often than HIV-1, and its early spread seems linked mostly to things like non-sterile needles. Okay, so for today, we're mostly talking about HIV-1 group M, the main one. Exactly. That's the one responsible for the vast majority of the pandemic we know. And the timing for that jump for group M, you said between 1890 and 1920. Roughly. That's what the genetic evidence points to, yes. Somewhere in that window, likely towards the early 20th century, around the 1920s. Which raises a huge question. If it jumped that early, maybe around the 1920s, why did it take so long, like decades, before it became this huge recognized epidemic in the 80s? Why the delay? That's uh, that's a really critical point. The understanding now is that HIV-1 Group M was probably spreading, but at a very low level, almost silently, you could say, in the Congo Basin area for decades, maybe from the 1920s right up until the 1960s or 70s. It's yeah. a slow burn. Exactly, a slow burn. The initial, most significant jump for Group M likely happened in southeast Cameroon. From there, scientists think it might have spread along river routes, like the Songa River, which connects down towards Leopoldville, that's now Kinshasa. Right. Or another possibility is through the movement of people, like the evacuation of Franco-Belgian occupying forces after colonial periods. The virus just traveled with people, unseen. How do scientists even figure out those dates, like the 1920s? How can they look back like that? They use a really clever technique called the molecular clock. Think of it like using the virus's own genetic code as a historical record. Okay. Viruses mutate. They change over time at a roughly predictable rate. Yeah. So scientists can look at very early samples of HIV. There's a famous one from a lymph node tissue sample taken in Leopoldville, Kinshasa, back in 1959. Right. 
They compare the genetic sequence of that old virus to newer ones, count the differences, factor in the mutation rate, and sort of wind the clock backwards to estimate when the common ancestor, the original human version, likely existed. So it's like genetic archaeology. Pretty much, yeah. Now, there are debates, you know, technical things like how recombination affects the clock. But even with those refinements, most recent studies still point strongly towards that early 20th century window around the 1920s for the initial jump. Okay, so the virus is spreading slowly for decades. Then something changes. What happened, especially in a big city like Leopoldville, Kinshasa, from the 1950s onwards that really let it take off? It wasn't just one thing. It was um, a combination of factors, a kind of perfect storm for the virus. Such as? First, a big increase in the use of injections for medical treatments. Things like arsenic-based drugs for syphilis were given by injection, widely. And crucially, hygiene wasn't always great. Needles and syringes were often reused without proper sterilization. Oh. There's documented evidence. For example, a clinic in Kinshasa that treated sex workers in the 1950s was giving hundreds of injections a day, up to 300 sometimes, often reusing equipment. We know this because there was an outbreak of hepatitis B linked to that clinic in 1953, clear proof of transmission through unhygienic injections. So medical practices inadvertently helped spread it. Massively, yes. Secondly, social changes played a big role. After the DRC gained independence in 1960, there was civil unrest, rapid city growth, unemployment. This led to a refugee crisis and, sadly, an increase in sex work with more clients. More sexual partners means more chances for a sexually transmitted virus, like HIV, to spread. Right. Societal disruption. Exactly. And third, there's evidence the virus itself might have changed. The specific strain that made it to Kinshasa seems to have been particularly good at spreading. Soon experiments suggest HIV-1 might have mutated after it got into humans, becoming, well, nastier better at killing CD4 immune cells than its SIV ancestor in chimps. It adapted to us. So better suited to spread in humans. Essentially, yes. More transmissible, perhaps more virulent. Now, alongside the scientific picture, there have been other theories, some quite persistent, about where HIV came from, things that caused a lot of fear. Can we talk about those, like the oral polio vaccine theory or the idea it was man-made? Absolutely. And it's vital we address these because understanding why they're wrong is as important as knowing the real story. The oral polio vaccine, or OPV theory, got a lot of attention. What was the claim there? The idea was that chimpanzee kidneys might have been used to grow the polio virus for some batches of oral vaccine given out in Central and West Africa between 1957 and 1960. The theory suggested SIV from those kidneys could have contaminated the vaccine and infected people. And proponents pointed to some overlap in locations. They did. They tried to link early HIV cases geographically to where those specific vaccination campaigns happened. And the other big one, the man-made idea. Yeah, that one emerged in the 80s. There were claims, sometimes framed as exposés, alleging HIV was actually created in a U.S. military biological weapons lab, often citing Fort Detrick around 1977, mm -hmm. and then deliberately released, perhaps in Zaire. Okay, those are some serious claims. How did science actually investigate them? They weren't just dismissed out of hand, were they? No, not at all. The scientific community took them very seriously and investigated rigorously. For the OPV theory, several things were done. Scientists went back and tested stored samples of those old polio vaccines. They found zero traces of SIV or HIV. None at all? None. Plus, a chemical called trypsin, which was used in making the vaccine, would actually destroy SIV anyway. And critically, the researchers who actually developed and produced those vaccines stated very clearly that chimpanzee kidneys were not used. Monkey kidneys, yes, but not chimp kidneys. And even if they had been, there were serious questions about whether enough virus could even survive and be transmitted orally through a vaccine to cause infection. So multiple lines of evidence against it. Correct. And for the man-made theory, the smoking gun really came from the virus's own genetics, again, that molecular clockwork we talked about. How did that disprove it? Viral sequencing proved definitively that HIV-1 was already circulating in people in Africa and even samples found in the U.S. before 1977. The genetic history showed the virus was much older than the supposed 1977 creation date. You can't have created something in 77 that already existed years earlier. The timeline just doesn't work. Not even close. It completely refutes the idea of it being manufactured in a lab in the late 70s. It really highlights why we need to rely on careful evidence-based science when we hear these kinds of alarming stories, especially about diseases. Okay, so the science is clear. 
Origins in Central African chimps jumped likely via hunting, spread slowly, then accelerated by social and medical factors in places like Kinshasa. How did it then get from there out to the rest of the world? How did it cross the Atlantic and end up being identified in the U.S. in the early 80s? The next key step seems to be Haiti. Genetic studies estimate that HIV-1, specifically the Group M subtype B, which became dominant in the West, reached Haiti from Central Africa around 1966. How did that happen? The most likely route involves migration. After the Democratic Republic of the Congo gained independence, many Haitians were recruited to work there, providing technical skills. Some likely got infected there and brought the virus back to Haiti when they returned. Okay, so human movement again? Exactly. And then, within Haiti, it's possible that a commercial plasma center in Port-au-Prince in the early 1970s might have played a role in amplifying the spread locally, perhaps through unhygienic practices during blood donation. And from Haiti to the U.S. Yes. The genetic evidence is pretty strong here. Multiple studies show that HIV-1 subtype B traveled from Haiti to the United States probably sometime in the mid-1970s. The transmission route seems to have been primarily sexual, particularly among men who have sex with men. The genetics clearly show the direction was Haiti to U.S., not the other way around. And once it was in the U.S., we started seeing those early signs, right, even before anyone knew what AIDS was. You mentioned some earlier. That's right. Looking back, the pieces started to fit together. There's that probable AIDS case from 1968, a young black man in St. Louis who died from Kaposi sarcoma, a cancer later strongly linked to AIDS. Retesting of his stored tissues confirmed HIV-1 subtype B. 1968, wow. Then, jumping forward to 1978, researchers were running a hepatitis B vaccine trial among gay men in San Francisco and New York. When they later went back and tested stored blood samples from that trial, they found about 4% of the San Francisco participants and 6% of the New York participants were already HIV positive in 78. So it was definitely circulating by that. Oh, yes. And even slightly earlier, 1977, there were diagnoses of severe immune problems in six infants in New York City, born to mothers who injected drugs. But respectively, these were recognized as perinatal HIV infections. And the blood supply issue. A huge factor for certain groups. By 1978, HIV was detected in stored blood samples from people with hemophilia. This was traced back to contaminated factor VIII's blood clotting concentrates. These concentrates were made by pooling plasma from thousands, sometimes up to 25,000 donors per batch. If even a few donors were infected, the whole batch could be contaminated, spreading the virus very efficiently to people relying on those treatments. It's tragic pathway. Absolutely. And from the U.S., particularly through these established pathways, sexual contact among men, contaminated factor VIII for hemophilia, and shared needles among injecting drug users the virus, primarily subtype B, then spread into Europe during the early 1980s. It's just incredible how scientists were able to piece together this timeline after the fact, connecting all these dots that must have seemed like isolated tragedies at the time. It really is a testament to epidemiological and virological detective work. AIDS was officially recognized, as you know, in 1981, primarily among gay men in the U.S. Mm. But these later investigations uncovered this whole hidden history stretching back much further and across different populations and continents. Were there similar early signs being noticed elsewhere outside the U.S.? Yes, definitely. In Zaire, now DRC in Rwanda, doctors documented the first probable cases in 1977. In Haiti, probable cases were noted in 1978 and 79, with the numbers clearly rising by 1980. There was a tragic case in Norway where a sailor, his wife, and child died of AIDS in 1976. Later testing showed the father had contracted HIV-1 type O, a different group, probably in Africa back in the early 1960s. Type O, so one of those other jumps. Exactly. And in Uganda and Tanzania around 1980, doctors started seeing a mysterious wasting disease they called SLIM. That was later understood to be AIDS. So the signals were starting to appear in different places, even if they weren't connected or understood globally until later. So wrapping this up, our deep dive really takes us on quite a journey. From chimps in Central Africa, through the specific conditions in colonial and post-colonial Kinshasa, across the ocean to Haiti, then into the U.S. and Europe, all before AIDS even had a name in 1981. It just powerfully shows how these huge health crises emerge from this complex mix of biology, environment, and social history. Absolutely. And looking at the bigger picture, understanding these complex origins isn't just about, you know, historical curiosity. It teaches us fundamental lessons for epidemiology, for public health today. It shows how interconnected the world is, how local events and specific conditions can, over time, spark a global pandemic. It underscores why we need constant vigilance, robust surveillance, and rapid scientific investigation for any emerging disease.
And maybe a final thought for you, the listener. We've seen incredible scientific progress in understanding HIV and developing life-saving treatments, but think about this. How do we make sure we and future generations are equipped to look critically at information about any new health threat? How do we learn to sort scientific consensus from the noise, the myths, the misinformation that inevitably pops up? That skill feels more crucial than ever.